I would now request Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, Chairperson, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, to please address the audience and talk to us about this special report which analyzes the impact of climate change on women and children. Please put your hands together for Dr. Swaminathan. Namaskar and good morning. Honorable Minister for Women and Child Development and Minority Affairs, Mrs. Uh, Smriti Zubin Irani ji. First of all, thank you so much, Madam, for having uh, agreed to come and uh, not just listen to the recommendations of this report, which is being released you know, with a really good gathering of business leaders, as well as um, government and UN um, leaders here in the room. Um, but I'm, I must tell you that this whole idea came from the minister herself. And a few months ago, she flagged to me this importance of this topic and the fact that no one was talking about the impact of climate change specifically on women and children. And obviously, it's an issue close to her heart. And so she asked us, along with Karmanya and uh, the BMGF, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who supported this study, to go ahead and do this. So we've put this together in a very, very short time frame. And I'm sure that with your inputs, and further suggestions, we'll be able to uh, really expand on this for our, uh, the final report. But we must start with the statement by the Prime Minister, who specifically, of course, this was in terms of an international forum where he said it's necessary to protect everyone's interests, um, but obviously the everyone includes women as well. And again, very quickly to say that climate change is impacting all of us. It's impacting us in ways that we can see as well as in ways that we cannot see. Those of us who are in this room are probably the more fortunate of us. We have the means to protect ourselves from some of the impacts of climate change. There are many others out there, men and women and children, who don't have the same capacity to, to be, uh, be able to adapt, to be resilient, and to carry on with life. And so whether this is just the health impacts, and we'll come to some of the other impacts, but whether it's heat-related illness, whether it's trauma, anxiety, post-traumatic stress because of being displaced from your home, whether it's more respiratory diseases because of air pollution, whether it's mosquito-borne um, diseases like dengue, chikungunya, malaria, malnutrition because of the unavailability of nutritious food, and of course, migration. All of this comes from the very basic threats to biodiversity, to the environment, more pollution, loss of soil, water shortage, and of course, global temperature rise. So we've, uh, for the purpose of this study, um, and again, this is something the minister herself had uh, asked us to look at agroecological zones. Because as you know, India, we work basis on the basis of states and districts um, and cities, but agroecological zones are an important uh, aspect because of the weather patterns and the way that they are likely to change. And therefore, this, of course, crosses state boundaries because nature doesn't follow administrative boundaries. So on this slide, what you can see really is uh, on the left, the, it's a map that's showing you the exposure in India to extreme hydromet disasters, that is floods, cyclones, and droughts. And you can see that 75% of Indian districts and about 80% of the population are um, exposed to one or more of these events. And many districts have floods and droughts alternately. Then in the middle, you see the heat waves. And of course, a large part of India is likely to experience uh, higher heat. But the areas which are in very dark red and brown are in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Rajasthan, etc., uh, are likely to have very, very high heat exposure. And then on the right side, you see a graph which looks at air pollution. And these are uh, the areas of India which, where the annual prevalence of PM 2.5 exceeds the national ambient air quality standards of 40 micrograms per cubic millimeter, which by itself is much higher than the WHO standard of five micrograms. So even the 40 microgram limit is being crossed in a large part of, uh, of India and in most of uh, our cities. So why do women, why are they disproportionately impacted? It's partly because of their roles and responsibilities, cultural norms. Of course, poverty always adds you know, to the mix of risk. 
Um, the UNDP says that women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die in a disaster, but they're also impacted by crop failure. This leads to uh, uh, food insecurity and more work on the field, water scarcity, um, conflicts and migration, healthcare, because women are more spending more time on, on the field or at work. They have less time to take care of their own health. They also, of course, have caregiving responsibilities, both for children and the elderly. Fuel, natural disasters, displacement, all of this impacts women, but also children. They are one of the most vulnerable, both to death and disability, but also to chronic effects, like heat, for example. We still don't understand how heat exposure is impacting children's learning. If they're sitting in a hot and humid classroom, can they really concentrate on their studies? We've seen that children, because they are smaller, they have uh, smaller airways and lungs, they breathe more rapidly, they are more uh, affected by air pollution than adults. And on the flip side, we need everyone for climate action, right? Climate action, if we are to adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change, it can't be done uh, unless women and children are involved and empowered. And in fact, there are studies which show that if you give women the same resources as men, they actually do much more with that. Even agricultural yield uh, improves. Women also have, of course, agricultural women have a lot of natural knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge and wisdom about what works and what doesn't. So if you empower them with the tools and the resources, they put it to use. Women have always been at the forefront of environmental conservation and more and more you see children now, right? Children are speaking up. They want action, they are demanding action because they know that it's their future, that they, they are going to live in a, in a world where you know, most of us will not be around. So this uh, scoping study, I'll just have time only to take you through the major recommendations. We did basically a literature review. We also did some analytics. We tried to identify the gaps in the literature and we had a lot of uh, discussions and regional workshops to gather inputs from uh, experts, from civil society organizations, from NGOs, and from the community themselves, from different agroecological zones of the country. Now, climatic events, of course, are sudden, like cyclones and tsunamis and flood, flash floods, but a lot of it is now gradual or recurrent, like heat waves and droughts and things like that. So the impacts are also can be sudden, and they can also be chronic or subacute. Now, just looking at a few indicators, what we did is only map hotspots. We are not even saying that there's a direct correlation between these, uh, for example, if you see um, uh, underweight women, you'll see that there's you know, a stretch across central India where there is underweight women, and in the same districts, you have a lot of the hydrometeorological disasters. Similarly, girl-child marriage. You know, you can see map districts where there's high girl-child marriage and also a lot of disasters. I already talked about heat waves. There is increased mortality due to heat, Again, uh, you know, the data is not out there. The data is very hard to, uh, to get and to really correlate some of these things, so we need to do more work on that. When pregnant women are exposed to high heat and air pollution, they have higher chance of premature babies being born and also higher chance of their own health, like high blood pressure and so on. We also know that air pollution contributes to the increased diabetes rates that we are seeing. Again, when people are exposed uh, to drought over the last 50 years, we looked at districts in India that have been exposed to drought repeatedly, and you find that even things like domestic violence, girl-child marriage, all of this increase in districts where there's more, uh, they've, they've had more drought. Women's livelihoods are impacted in many different ways, whether it's agriculture, whether it's uh, migrant. Now, the migrants could be men. Women get left behind in their villages, which means they have to do more work they have to tend to the fields and they have to look after the household, the children, etc. cetera. Um, Non-timber based, uh, produ produce based livelihoods because of loss of forest, loss of biodiversity. This is also impacting many of the livelihoods, traditional livelihoods that women, especially in our tribal areas had 
and the warming of the ocean, we often forget about the coastal communities. And India has such a long coastline. And there are people involved in fishing, but also non-fishing livelihoods. And they're all getting impacted by salinization, by the rise of sea level, by the loss of uh, you know, reducing fish yields that the small fishermen are able to get. And of course, they're also being impacted by heat and humidity. Now again, children, we know that many of the gains we've made in child survival could be undermined now because of the impacts of climate. And again, these graphs just show just examples of stunting and underweight in children in the same areas as areas which have extreme floods, droughts, and so on. We know again that heat waves, air pollution, floods are all impacting, especially newborns and infants in the first year after birth. And the same relationship we see in children who have living in drought prone areas are more likely to be stunted and have less minimum uh, the dietary diversity, so the, what they eat on their plate is also less. Again, climate hazards, children's education, we know that when you're disrupted, you have to be moved out of your home, learning will be disrupted. And not only it's just uh, the learning, but it's also children's cognitive and socio-emotional development. I was talking to a psychiatrist colleague in Chennai who said this whole thing about eco-anxiety, that they're actually, she's actually seeing children in her psychiatric practice who are so worried all the time that their homes will be affected, that you know, they won't be able to go to school, that they're constantly anxious and having nightmares about uh, climate. It's also because of all the gloom and doom stories that they see on media. So coming to some of the recommendations and in interims, India does have a national action plan and state action plans for climate change, but they do not operationalize the gender elements adequately or evenly, even though the national action plan does say that this plan needs to be gender sensitive. This is the time to review those state action plans on climate change and make them not just gender sensitive, but gender transformational. Hopefully with the minister's uh, guidance and blessings, this can happen. We need a budgetary allocation. Without finances flowing into these things, these policies just sit on paper and uh, cannot be operationalized. We need monitoring, we need evaluation, and we need more research, longitudinal studies to see what's the impact. And if you put in an intervention, if you do something, what is, how does it positively or negatively impact women? We talked about pregnant women, and so heat action needs to be prioritized. What are local urban bodies doing about heat? What are companies doing to protect their employees from heat? Um, can Asha's and Anganwadi workers deliver tailored messages for pregnant women? We also need to see what is a heat wave. There's just one definition of a heat wave today for the whole of India. But I live in Chennai. 40 degrees in Chennai and 40 degrees in Delhi are very different the way they impact the body because you have to add the humidity factor. And therefore, the heat wave definitions need to be looked at. We can look at the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana scheme, which is the Ayushman Bharat to make sure that the benefit packages and the delivery of those schemes at the health and wellness centers, at the primary health centers, are including climate sensitive diseases. There is a direct correlation between natural disasters and increased gender-based violence. So there needs to be something done about that. Gender clinics, hotlines, helplines for women, particularly in those areas impacted by extreme weather events. Emergency shelters, there are studies showing that women's needs for toilets and for menstrual health, these are often not even thought about when emergency shelters are set up. So they, they, all of these need a gender uh, uh, lens and, and make sure that their needs are met. Biomass for cooking, unfortunately, still many women are using biomass because they cannot afford to use only uh, uh, LPG, even though they mostly have access to LPG, they can't afford the refills. And so we have to think of how can we make at least clean energy for cooking. You know, that should be done in the next few years. And then women as first responders, we know that the majority of healthcare providers, Anganwadi workers, nurses, community health, op they're all women. They themselves have needs. They themselves get affected by climate. And therefore we have to also support our women workers in the, in the field. We'll talk more in the panel on livelihoods and what can be done, but we need multi-sectoral and convergent action. Panchayats have to be empowered. They need to be given the funds. Local urban bodies need to have a plan and funding. Um, and of course, SSG, self-help groups 
can do a lot. And finally, I'll come to the point again on uh, gender-based budgeting. How do we do that in an effective manner? Can we have a gender focal point in each ministry? We need more research to understand the gendered impacts of climate. And um, of course, we can't forget that there are other vulnerable groups, the elderly, the disabled, so women and children, yes, but there are also these other groups that... Um, so I'd like to thank very much the uh, minister again for having asked us to do this. We've learned so much, but I also want to thank the team. And if you don't mind standing up, because I don't have a slide with your names, um, Arundita, Anjali, Amit, um, and the Karmanya team. Could you please, yeah. Sandeep, Shubangi, thank you all so much for uh, uh, making this happen. And certainly we'll continue to work after we receive your inputs and feedback. Thank you so much.